On the 1st of September 1939, German troops invaded Poland. Two days later, Britain and France declared war on Germany. Within a year, the Wehrmacht had overrun most of continental Europe, and the British army had been evacuated, minus most of its heavy equipment. In 1940, an angry public looking for someone to blame for the debacle found a voice in the widely publicised book Guilty Men. Contained within was a withering attack on almost all British statesmen that had dealt in the last six years with Berlin and its leadership. They condemned in particular the attempts to placate Germany in the lead up to the war, a strategy which came to be defined in a single word, appeasement. No other word in the English language is so associated with cowardice and spinelessness. No insult as devastating to an opponent in foreign policy. The British Prime Minister, Neville Chamberlain, was found particularly culpable, not only for his strategy, but also for gloating about it with the infamous scrap of paper that had guaranteed peace in our time after the Munich Agreement. In general, this remains the historical consensus. At almost any point before 1939, it is argued, a war between the Western Allies and Germany would have been over quickly. Chamberlain was not, however, the caricature of a naive old fool easily taken in by Berlin that posterity has remembered him as, nor was appeasement a strategy that was either hopelessly ineffective or left Britain totally ill-equipped to fight Germany. This video will aim to act as something of a reappraisal of Chamberlain and try to understand the logic of appeasement. Neville Chamberlain acceded to the Premiership with popular support in 1937. Son of the famous and flamboyant politician Joe, he was a more moderate man in all respects. Having entered politics late, Chamberlain rose quickly to the position of Chancellor, before declining the office in 1924 to become Health Secretary, in which capacity he proved an able and compassionate reformer. In 1931, he once again took the Chancellorship, with an empire tottering on the edge of the abyss in the aftermath of the Great Depression. In his term, Chamberlain balanced the budget, ended the costly absurdity of free trade in favour of a system of imperial preference, and recorded the most rapid period of sustained economic growth in British history. Outside staple industries particularly dependent on the world economy, such as the Jarrow shipbuilders, the British experience in the 1930s compared to many other Western nations was something of a success story, based on sound and careful finance. Chamberlain hoped in 1937 that his premiership would be the culmination of a successful reforming career, with his efforts spent on improving the domestic situation. It wasn't to be. As Chamberlain became Prime Minister, foreign office fears of Germany were already acute. Though only the likes of Churchill yet completely understood how expansive Germany's ambitions really were, few seriously thought the country was devoted to the cause of peace. Yet in the immediate term, Britain was severely restricted in what action it could take by its own inadequate defences. By the end of 1936, Whitehall was thinking in terms of appeasement, not as a way of satiating Germany, but as a strategy to buy time for Britain to rearm, which would allow it to negotiate from strength. Britain in 1935, when Germany's breaches of the Versailles Treaty were first put on open display, was not in any way ready for war. True, an alliance with France and her large army could at this stage have probably crushed Germany, but Britain would have been asking Paris to actually wage the war, and convincing either nation's population to fight over German rearmament would have been impossible. What's more, Germany in 1935 seemed like the least of Whitehall's problems. Britain held a globe-spanning empire, and naturally, Germany was not the only threat. Two other possible enemies loomed large. In the Mediterranean, Mussolini's Italy had implemented a major naval expansion, and that year began an invasion of Ethiopia. In the Far East, Japan, once Britain's ally, now seemed like an increasingly rapacious enemy. Germany, Italy and Japan were three threats that could all potentially be united against the British Empire. The Chiefs of Staff believed a rearmed Britain could fight one, potentially two, but if all three combined together, the Empire would be doomed. This was the context within which all of Britain's policy towards Germany took place. Britain had to rebuild its military in a sustainable way, and drive a wedge between these three potential allies. Compromises would then have to be made. This was also the backdrop to Germany's remilitarisation of the Rhineland in 1936. British politicians were not naive about the consequences of such a move on Germany's part. Baldwin, Chamberlain and Eden did all counsel against action and advocated restraining the French, yet this was not because they viewed German actions as legitimate, 
or because they believed concessions would moderate German behaviour, but because they believed that Britain was not yet ready for war with Germany. Of particular concern in 1936 was air power, which Germany was far ahead in. The Joint Planning Committee predicted Britain would suffer 150,000 casualties from bombing in the first week alone of the war. Bertrand Russell declared that after a single air raid, London will be one vast raving bedlam. The hospitals will be stormed, traffic will cease, the homeless will shriek for help. Then the enemy will dictate the terms. In this context, Chamberlain echoed that our own air forces were so weak today that we could not do Germany much harm, but that in two years' time we should be able to hit her fairly hard. Indeed, Chamberlain had already pushed through an expansive air rearmament programme as Chancellor, overriding Treasury objections in 1934. In hindsight, fears of German bombers were grossly overstated. The Luftwaffe inflicted 147,000 casualties from bombing in the entire Second World War, as opposed to the 150,000 predicted within a week. Even so, British statesmen could only listen to what they were being told, and Baldwin reflected the general consensus when he somewhat hysterically declared, the bomber will always get through. Britain's international position was likewise even more tenuous in 1936. Germany and Japan had signed the Anti-Comintern Pact, which, though not explicitly aimed at Britain, foreshadowed a possible future alliance between the two powers. The stance of Italy also remained unclear. An attempt at maintaining good relations by legitimising Mussolini's invasion of Abyssinia with the whole of Al Pact had been scuttled after a public outcry. London could at this point have completely reversed course and blocked the Suez Canal to Italian use, thus throttling its war effort. Perhaps this might have stopped the dictators in their tracks, but it could just as easily have triggered an open conflict with Rome, again at a time when Germany and Japan remained hostile. Dithering on its Italian policy ended up eroding Britain's strategic position even further when Mussolini acceded to the Anti-Comintern Pact in 1937, opening the way for the German annexation of Austria that Italy had previously prevented. More crushingly, the American Congress passed the Neutrality Act, which forbade the sale of munitions to any war belligerent, whilst the Johnson Act had three years earlier blocked Britain's ability to raise loans there. If Britain chose to go to war, she could not wage it with American material and money. Although the US President Roosevelt was sympathetic to Britain, he was restricted by his own country's public opinion, and in general preferred platitudes to action. His offers of peace conferences were then, as now, grasped at by critics of appeasement as a potential way of enveloping the United States in a European settlement. But the reality was there was never any chance of Washington committing itself in such a way. If Britain and France were to fight Germany, they would be doing it on their own, and Britain alone was not an attractive prospect in 1937. Upon his accession to the Premiership, Chamberlain was confronted with a depressing memorandum from the Chiefs of Staff, which lamented the poor state of the British Armed Forces and their inadequacy to meet all potential threats. It warned, We cannot foresee a time when our defence forces will be strong enough to safeguard our territory and vital interests against Germany, Italy and Japan simultaneously. We cannot exaggerate the importance from the point of view of imperial defence of any political or international action which could be taken to reduce the number of our potential enemies and to gain the support of potential allies. The strategy Chamberlain decided upon to counter this was two-pronged. Firstly, limited German grievances, territorial or otherwise, would be used as bait to try and rope Berlin back into a European settlement, after which the friendship with Italy would likely fade, and Japan could be dealt with. At the same time, British rearmament would be sped up, allowing Whitehall to negotiate from a position of strength. Defence expenditure did, however, remain limited in 1937. Unlike Germany, which was shoveling an unsustainable amount of money into the Wehrmacht, largely on the basis that conquered territories would reimburse the Reich's treasury, Britain had no nations to plunder as a means of financing her military. Chamberlain, who had just set the British economy back in order, hoped to pay for rearmament in a sustainable way that would allow Britain's long-term economic strengths to overcome Germany's short-term armament splits. It was undoubtedly naive, and highlighted the fact Chamberlain never quite grasped just how expansive Berlin's aims were. Where Chamberlain isn't given enough credit, however, is his pragmatism. After the Anschluss of Austria was formalised in March 1938, Chamberlain reluctantly concluded that he could no longer privilege economic stability over rapid rearmament. 
telling the cabinet that the appropriate response to Germany's insatiable appetite was to accelerate the military build-up, regardless of its broader economic cost. The new budget still did not match what Germany was spending, but then Britain, which had the resources to finance rearmament at such a level almost indefinitely, would in the near future still overtake German military power, which would at some point wither as the holes in the Reich's kleptocratic economy were revealed. But this could only work so long as Britain did not end up in a war when Germany's short-term spending had given it the temporary advantage. The Anschluss of Austria in 1938 undoubtedly strengthened Berlin, and may even have staved off a serious economic crisis in Germany by way of providing badly needed foreign exchange, but Britain was in no position to oppose the action. Despite rearmament beginning to truly get underway in the aftermath, the Royal Air Force still largely consisted of biplanes, and the army remained underfunded in favour of naval and air spending. Had Britain bluffed and stumbled into a war it was unprepared for, public opinion would have been irreconcilably divided. Chamberlain was not blind as to what the annexation of Austria represented. He wrote to his sister, It is perfectly evident, surely now, that force is the only argument Germany understands, and that collective security cannot offer any prospect of preventing such events until it can show a viable force of overwhelming strength backed by determination to use it. He followed up these words with action, sweeping aside treasury objections once more, London adopted the ambitious Scheme L, which called for the production of 12,000 modern combat aircraft over the next two years, whilst in France, Plan 5 was agreed upon which mandated the re-equipping of the Air Force, large enhancements to the army and increased naval construction. The result was that Berlin found it had to increase yet further the already exorbitant German defence budget. Military spending topped 19% of national income for the calendar year, completely unsustainable unless there was war. Most criticisms of appeasement, however, do not mainly focus on this early period. Ultimately, the whole sordid business of Munich is where the problems with Chamberlain's strategy are said to lie. Following the Anschluss, Berlin began encouraging the large population of Sudeten Germans to protest the Czechoslovak government. On the 21st of May, a crisis in Czech-German relations led to a partial mobilisation of Czech forces. The crisis was overcome, but had serious repercussions. Berlin was convinced that Germany had been humiliated and became determined to destroy the Czechs. By September 1938, he had pushed matters to the brink of war. Britain did not have any commitments to Czechoslovakia. France did, and hence were more belligerent on the issue. Though in general, French statesmen were more perceptive of the threat Germany posed anyway. They were unwilling, however, to intervene without British aid. Nonetheless, should Germany invade Czechoslovakia, there was every likelihood France would be sucked in, at which point Britain would realistically have to fight. Indeed, when it seemed all negotiations had failed, it was in fact announced on the 26th of September that the Royal Navy was mobilising. It is regularly argued that the Czechs had a well-equipped army, dug into modern defences along natural borders, and thus could have held off the Wehrmacht, yet it remains hard to see how Britain and France could have assisted them in the war. Even in 1939, the French army was unwilling to stray far beyond their defences on the Maginot Line, and they were unlikely to do so with any tenacity a year earlier, unless the German army was decisively defeated. Especially considering the German air power advantage, felt so acutely in 1940, was still a fact in 1938, though admittedly wildly over-exaggerated by the air ministry. Britain and France would then be fighting to the last Czech effectively, True, the Wehrmacht of 1938 was not that of 1939, when it had plundered Prague's tanks and factories. Thus, it is not unreasonable to suggest the Czechs may have held off an offensive. But as Chamberlain himself wrote to his sister, you have only to look at the map to see that nothing that France or we could do could possibly save Czechoslovakia from being overrun by the Germans if they wanted to do it. The Austrian frontier is practically open, the great Skoda munition works are within easy bombing distance of the German aerodromes. The railways all pass through German territory. Russia is 100 miles away. Therefore, we could not help Czechoslovakia. She would simply be a pretext for going to war with Germany. That we could not think of unless we had a reasonable prospect for being able to beat her to her knees in reasonable time. And of that, I see no sign. 
Britain then, in the view of Chamberlain and most of his military advisers, simply did not have the ability to fight a war in 1938, and thought the Czechs had little chance on their own. The possibility of bluffing was discussed, but if this was called, which it would likely have been as Germany had every intention of fighting the Czechs, the result was bound to be an obliteration of British prestige. Those that did support a firm line, such as Duff Cooper, seemed to have done so in the belief that Germany was bluffing, which was untrue. Could an answer have been found in the Russian connection? Churchill later promoted the possibility of a grand alliance which would have deterred Germany at this stage, but any Russian pact would inevitably have meant the Red Army, whose capabilities Chamberlain not without reason doubted, marching through Romania and Poland. Neither nation would countenance such a prospect, and besides, the British ambassador to Moscow, Viscount Chilton, reported that despite brave words, serious aid from the Soviets was unlikely. The wider international situation also remained unfavourable. How Japan and Italy would react was still uncertain, though the Navy expected at least the Italians to enter the war. All of the Dominions, with the exception of New Zealand, had strongly supported appeasement at the previous year's Imperial Conference, calling into question whether Britain would have at its disposal the overseas manpower that was so vital in the Great War. Kristallnacht had not yet occurred and thus American isolationists would have happily portrayed the conflict as just another European squabble. Even the fact that the German Condor Legion was still operating in Spain, possibly threatening Gibraltar, raised questions about whether the time was right for intervention. Jack Levi sums up why Britain gave way in 1938. At its core then, the decision to abandon the Sudetenland to Berlin was based on the belief that a deterrent threat by Britain was tantamount to an empty bluff that, if called, would have resulted either in a humiliating surrender, or worse, a devastating defeat. It was not based entirely on British naivety or expectation that it would permanently satiate Germany. This is not to say Chamberlain was a diplomatic mastermind, or that Munich was even the right course of action but it does refute the popular accusation of him being a naive clown. Indeed, in the aftermath of Munich, it was Berlin who felt they'd been outplayed, and denied the short victorious war he had wanted. Chamberlain does seem to have been swept along by the public adulation upon his return, unlike Deladier, who appears to have had serious doubts about the affair, and remarked, the imbeciles, if only they knew what they were acclaiming. Chamberlain's silly piece in our time quote is repeated ad nauseum, as if the phrase itself serves as an indictment of the entire appeasement strategy. Yet despite his undoubted hopes of having found a final peace settlement, at the same time Chamberlain resisted calls to scale back rearmament. He was proved correct by Kristallnacht when Berlin's barbarism was put on full display, and hopes that the regime could be moderated died. Certainly Halifax, until that point also a supporter of appeasement, saw the events of November the 9th as a turning point. Yet if Kristallnacht began to finally kill hopes for a lasting settlement with Germany, it also served to strengthen Britain's strategic position. America responded with a hurricane of public outrage. Only the intervention of Cordell Hull prevented the US from imposing punitive tariffs on German exports. This was then undone by the German occupation of Prague and final collapse of Czechoslovakia in March 1939. Roosevelt swept aside objections and imposed a 25% tariff on German imports, which was viewed in Berlin as being tantamount to a declaration of war, whilst the President talked openly of supplying the Western Allies with 20,000 aircraft. In Britain, the response to the occupation of Czechoslovakia was even more loud, public opinion was offended, and even Henderson, greatest of the appeasers, recognised, it was the final shipwreck of my mission to Berlin. The Military Training Act was implemented in May, in effect a form of conscription that enabled Britain to put 10 fully motorised divisions in France the next year, instead of the two under-equipped ones available a year earlier. By the summer of 1939, almost all biplanes had been replaced with mainly Hawker Hurricanes, while Spitfires also began to arrive in large quantities that would not have been available a year earlier. What's more, the international situation was also more firmly in the Allies' favour than in 1938. Britain and France extended territorial guarantees to much of Eastern Europe. Berlin had hoped its military build-up would see these states fall into Germany's sphere by mere threat alone. Yet throughout the summer of 1939, Turkey, Greece, Yugoslavia and even Bulgaria all moved towards the Allied camp. Even Romania, whom Berlin considered a top priority for its oil production, proved a much harder negotiator than expected following a Western guarantee withholding oil for the first time in June 1939, 
until Berlin agreed to a consignment of late model Messerschmitts. The inescapable reality for the Germans was that in the aftermath of Prague, Britain and France had put aside all differences and the US seemed increasingly hostile. They could not even count on military superiority for much longer. The Wehrmacht's chief economist, Thomas, calculated that whereas Germany planned to devote 23% of its national income to the military in 1939, the figure for France was 17% and for Britain only 12, yet combined they would soon outclass the Wehrmacht and whereas the Western Allies could keep up this level of spending for years to come, Germany was rapidly reaching the end of its economic road, particularly a dearth of foreign exchange that exacerbated a raw material bottleneck. Indeed, as of spring 1939, British aircraft production matched that of the Reich. The walls were closing in on Germany. The only way Berlin could possibly balance the odds now was to lock Japan and Italy into a firm alliance. Yet even here Germany was in a worse position than it had been a year earlier. On the 31st of May, the Italians informed Berlin that, despite their recent commitment to the Axis, they would not be ready for war before 1943, whilst Japan was decisively alienated by Germany's new alliance. The Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact was undoubtedly a ruthless bit of realpolitik that allowed the Germans to draw on Russian resources and avert the worst of the British naval blockade. In 1940, the Soviet Union would supply Germany with 65% of its chrome ore needs, 55% of its manganese, 40% of its nickel imports and 34% of its imported oil. The conclusion of this treaty has saved us, the Quartermaster General of the German Army said. Had then Chamberlain dithered too long in coming to an agreement with the Soviets? The answer is perhaps. Chamberlain's anti-communism was undoubtedly an issue, but he had not actually blocked any of the talks with Moscow. The reality was that the complications with the Russian alliance remained numerous. Poland would still not have the Red Army on its soil for obvious reasons. The price for any treaty seemed to be the Baltic states and Stalin was hardly the most reliable of allies. Indeed, even before the pact became official, he had been hinting towards his wish for a war between capitalism and fascism, which would see both sides exhaust themselves. The Molotov-Ribbentrop pact was a blow that seems not to have quite registered in Whitehall just how much it scuppered a lot of the planned naval blockade's effectiveness. Yet it couldn't make up for the inherently inferior strategic position Germany found itself in in almost every regard as September approached. 1939 was seen in many ways as the last chance for Germany. If she delayed the war any longer, her temporary advantage in armaments would be lost. The debacles of May 1940 obscure in popular memory just how dire the situation was for Germany before the fall of France. When the war began, Reich Treasury experts calculated Germany had the resources for three years worth of war, but this was on the basis that the Wehrmacht did almost no fighting after the defeat of Poland. For the type of knockout blow Berlin wanted in the West, it would in a very real sense be an all or nothing gamble for the Germans. If the Allies stalemated the Wehrmacht rather than won, an outcome the Germans themselves thought almost certain after wargaming the Ardennes thrust, Germany would very quickly expend its resources and lose the war. This is perhaps the tragedy of Chamberlain and appeasement. In many ways, Britain and France had been set up well to win the fight they had never wanted. The reality was that the Germans got very, very, very lucky with their sickle cut. Even down to events like the Mechelen incident, which whether or not it changed the German war plan, it did mean the French shifted reserves meant to be covering Sedan to the armies striking into the Low Countries. And yet the Allies did still ultimately lose in 1940. Owing to the fact they had agreed to fight Germany by issuing a guarantee to Poland just before the window of opportunity closed for good on Berlin, and the Western rearmament schemes pulled ahead. Is there then an alternate criticism of appeasement to be made? Should the real complaint be not that Chamberlain pursued this strategy at all, but that he failed to do so to its logical conclusion? Surely that logical end was when Britain and France decisively overtook Germany in terms of armament. Their abilities were roughly even in 1940. Had they postponed the war until 1941 or 1942? probably by not issuing the guarantees to Eastern nations, their numerical superiority would have been so overwhelming they would have won decisively. Indeed, Poland, which had also taken part in the dismemberment of Czechoslovakia, and was itself ruled by an authoritarian government, was an odd choice to begin a war over. But the other side of the coin was, as British and French policymakers well knew, one of strategy and prestige. 
Germany had humiliated the Western Allies at Prague in March. Without the guarantees then handed out in mid-1939, most of Eastern Europe would have fallen into the German sphere once the aftershock of the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact was felt. The Poles, without a guarantee that made them wrongly assume the West was going to assist militarily, would probably have settled over Danzig. The free city Berlin had set its sights on, and been pushed into something akin to vassal status, as it seems Berlin might have originally planned. Yet it's hard to see how this would have delayed a war in the West. Munich, where in spite of popular memory, Britain had been reluctantly prepared to go to war, and Berlin forced to back down, seems to have convinced them that Germany would have to defeat Britain and France before they could turn on the Soviets. A German war of aggression would probably have been likely before the Allies decisively overcame the Wehrmacht's military lead. Is the more traditional criticism of appeasement then correct? Should the Allies have refused any negotiations over the Sudetenland in 1938 and fought instead? The answer is probably yes. The French Army's command structure would not have been in any better condition, and aid from Britain would have been even more limited than it was a year later. But without Czech tanks and designs, the Germans wouldn't have been able to undertake the rapid campaign that got inside the French control loop and caused their rapid defeat. Ultimately, these two alternatives are counterfactuals, but what we do know is that Chamberlain had not made an Allied defeat inevitable in 1940, nor was appeasement an inherently irrational strategy. Even if Britain had won the Second World War quickly, the expense would still have been disastrous for an empire that was, to quote John Charmley, like the Habsburg monarchy of Metternich's day, in that Britain could only remain a great power so long as it avoided war. Yet Chamberlain was wrong in the end. His blend of appeasement and rearmament had never been about buying time, as some have argued, for his policy was always predicated on the belief Germany was ultimately appeasable. And it is his failure to grasp that she wasn't, even in 1939, that will always dog his legacy.